Welcome to the Global Business Women's Pod, brought to you by the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce. I am Susan Dyson and proud to be the CEO, President, and Founder of the Chamber. Please join us for this empowering podcast every Thursday at 6 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the nationally known speaker, author, and the first woman to fly the Boeing 747, and the first woman to captain a 747 transoceanic flight, Lynn Ripplemeyer. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, the invitation to be here. And I think there's a certain trend going on here of commonality with the women in this room, definitely the ones that I've been um, listening to. I'm going to try to cram uh, 50 years into uh, 20 minutes. And they say the easy, uh, picture's worth a 1,000 words. So I'm going to take you through a scrapbook of some photographs that'll tell my story. I grew up in southern Illinois on a farm. Um, there were no women airline pilots. Uh, we would, would have um, airplanes go overhead, and they said that it was flying the pipeline. And we would wave at them, and they'd rock their wings. And I'd comment how cool that would be to be able to see the world from up there, and heard, uh, you're a girl. There are no, girls don't fly airplanes. OK, I figured there must be some good reason for that. And the closest I could get to seeing what the world looked like was to ride my horse, Lucky, up to the top of the bluff where we lived and see what it looked like from up there, these beautiful fields of green and gold stitched together with railroad tracks and creeks. And imagine that that horse had wings like Pegasus, and I could see what that would look like. And when I would mention, yeah, but uh, well, what you can do, you can be a teacher or a nurse. Those are my two choices. I didn't like blood, so I thought I'd be a teacher. I did have an educational scholarship to University of Illinois. So I went there to teach. And my first job was, or actually student teaching, was at Wicker Park Junior High, inner city Chicago. Sure, jump right into the deep end, Lynn. Um, really wanted to teach those kids to love to learn to read. All the principal wanted me to do was keep them quiet. Uh, didn't get along with the principal. Loved the kids. Principal, not so much. Didn't last. Didn't lead to a job. So I went with a girlfriend who wanted, <clears throat> a girlfriend asked me to go with her to uh, interview for a, to be a TWA flight, uh, flight attendant, or stewardess then. And I said, sure, I can help you do that. So I rode with her. Well, it turns out the interviewer was her mom's best friend. So she got hired, but didn't want to move to New York by herself. So I said, sure, I can help you do that. We both got hired, and we moved to New York. It, it, it usually doesn't happen that easy. This was our training class. If you'll notice, there's one gentleman in the back. It was the first, one of the first men that got hired, and they had to change the name from stewardess to flight attendant. So this is when flight attendants came about. Um, my uniforms are also tell a little bit about the society at that time. We started out with hot pants and go-go boots, <laughs> uh, went to um, a safari outfit, and then finally a little bit to the more military look. That top picture is the um, circular stairs that go up to the cockpit of a 747. So that 747, um, TWA had just gotten the 747s. It had just come online. Of course, it was the favorite airplane for the pilots, so the most senior pilots were flying it. It was the least favorite for the flight attendants, because all of a sudden, we had um, five zones, all different sizes, and everything had to happen at the same time, because the, t the movie screens came down at the front of the section, and everybody had to watch the movie at the same time. Um, so being most junior, I was the one that had to deal with the cockpit. Sexual harassment had not been coined yet. So it was a whole lot of fun for these guys to make fun of the uh, young girls, um, embarrass them. Hey, we're having a contest. What's your bra size? Stuff like that, um, and worse. But I got to see that view that I wanted to see, that I could only dream about. And I found out if I quickly asked questions about what was going on up there, their job, the airplane, we could have an adult conversation, and I could learn something. And I loved it. And then even when I was senior enough to not have to go up there, that's where I wanted to work. And eventually, I got the added, if these guys can be doing this, I don't really get why women can't. 
So had a little bit of an attitude about it. <clears throat> Pilots went out on strike, so we didn't have a job. Um, so I'm in New Jersey. We found out this cute little beach house that we had didn't have, winter, didn't have a, a furnace. And my fl flight attendant roommate, who had worked for Delta, also had a job on a boat. And so she's down in Antigua, gives a call, says, hey, we need some help. Can you come help us? Sure, I can do that. So I go down to help her on the boat. The gentleman next to us uh, um, in a boat by himself, he's from Vermont, from Lake Champlain. When the strike's over, he's trying to take his boat back to Lake Champlain and gets about as far as Poughkeepsie, where the Hudson River starts, and there you have locks that you have to get through. He needed help getting through those locks and said, can you help me with this, you know, get the, sure, I can do that. <laughs> so I help him get the boat through the locks and we end up in Lake Champlain. And I feel like I've been dropped in the middle of a novel. These people own their own islands. He was a, a congressman for Vermont. He's the reason that there are no billboards in Vermont. He and his girlfriend invited me to stay with them and pretty soon all the neighbors from the neighboring islands are coming in to say hi in their boats or their seaplanes. So Don and Bill from the next island over fly in, in this seaplane and while they're catching up, I'm looking in the cockpit and, under, and recognize a few of the instruments. So I know two airplanes at this point, a 747 and a Piper Cub. <laughs> but there are some similarities and I, so I'm showing interest and the gentleman says, hey, do you wanna go up for a flight? Yeah. And he, he says, yeah, my wife and I are instructors, but we, um, we need a student. <laughs> I, I can help you out with that. So he takes us up, which was more of a, for, I find out later he would, he enjoyed taking young girls up for more of a fright than a flight. So we were doing stalls and spins that you should not do in a seaplane, but I was still smiling when we came back. So I spent one of the best summers of my life getting to fly this little seaplane. And Dawn, his wife, gave me the ground school out of the private pilot handbook so that I, if I ever did want to take the written test, I could. But there was no reason to get a license. There were no female pilots, it was, but it was a wonderful hobby. And um, from there, um, <laughs> I'm on one of my flights and uh, serving the first class um, meals, and a young man is reading that private pilot handbook. I said, hey, I'm reading that too. And he goes, really? And I said, yeah, but I can't do anything with it. We gotta take the seaplane out of the water. The lake's gonna freeze over. <laughs> he said, well, they make airplanes with wheels. I said, oh, I said, I'm taking uh, lessons down in Miami. Why don't you come down? I'll introduce you to my instructor. So I did and um, started taking, they said, yeah, you know, another couple weeks and a little more money, you can get your private pilot license. And then I, I was hooked. It's the closest thing to an addiction I can understand. That's all I wanted to do, only place I wanted to be. Um, in fact, I, so I'm using all my flight attendant income to pay for these lessons. At that time, they're $23 an hour. And I can still remember <clears throat> I needed a new blouse, but that blouse was either $23 an hour or else I could have an hour in an airplane. The blouse could wait. So um, I got my commercial instrument and the uh, school where I was said, if you get your instructor's license, we'll hire you as an instructor. <clears throat> so I did, and then I was flying charters. So this is uh, where I was instructing and flying charters. I don't have time to explain this check about Richard Bach, uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Anyway, he helped me start an airplane fund. Um, I've written two books. I'm going to have to cut all these stories short. The rest of the stories are in the books in the back. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite charter was my two grandpas. I took up in this plane to show them their fields. It was the first time they'd ever been in an airplane. And I realized what a gift to give someone, the gift of flight. But as I'm going like this to show them their fields, they're going like this, leaning against the... I think they had more fun saying their granddaughter took them for a flight than they did actually having a flight. That, those instructions then allowed me to apply um, to a little commuter in Illinois called Air Illinois. I heard news that changed my life. American and Frontier had hired their first female pilots. I wrote to them and said, really? I mean." The guys at TWA tell me there's just no way they're ever going to let women fly airplanes because they just don't have it emotionally, psychologically, physically. And then there's time of, that time of the month they really shouldn't leave the house and scheduling can't. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and you can't expect scheduling to schedule around that. And um, the one thing that they did say that was true, though, was I needed 1,000 hours of jet time. And all these guys had gotten it out of the military. Called the military. Nope, nobody's hiring women. I did call, and then they suggested the National Guard and the Reserves. So I did call them, and the one gentleman was very sympathetic, said, I, you know, my girlfriend tells me there's an organization not called NOW, National Organization for Women. And they help women pay the court costs to get uh, through the courts to get things that they couldn't do before. So I'm talking to my mom and dad that night and say, hey, I think I found a way I can um, get the jet time um, and get into the reserves. Um, there's this organization called NOW, and they'll help me sue. OK, my staunch Republican um, farmer Midwest father says, and just who are you going to sue? I guess the US government. Yeah, over my dead bodies, my daughter suing the US government. You will find another way. And I did. I'm walking through the airport in St. Louis, and here's a little kiosk that says Air Illinois. I start talking to the guys. Um, they say, yeah, if you come in for an interview, we'll take you down free. They sit me in, in the um, front seat in a Twin Otter. You're almost in the cockpit. I find out they really want to know about TWA hiring, because they're trying to get hours to be able to get into the major airlines. Um, I want to find out, now that I know that the, the Twin Otter is considered jet time, that I can maybe um, get the time that I need. Because I've written to, it's, the ladies' names are Emily and um, Bonnie, and they said, uh, yeah, you just need more time. You can do this. Women will be able to be, fly airplanes at the commercial airlines. I can't tell you what a difference it makes to have a mentor, to tell you that what you wanted to do that you thought was impossible is being done, and that you can do it too. So if you have a chance to be a mentor, do it. It makes all the difference in the world. Um, I got hired by Air Illinois, and um, they had hired another lady about three months earlier. I definitely got the impression from the owner who I met that he did not like having women at his airline. So I was very surprised. It comes into my class uh, at the end of it and says, OK, you're hired. They tell me you're doing really well. And of course, we've hired another lady named Emily. She's a captain. You're a first officer. But you know you can't fly together. I, I, they tell me I don't keep my emotions off my face real well. And so I guess I'm looking, why? So it's, well, we're going to have to have a man up there in case anything goes wrong, right? <laughs> and we don't want to be scaring away our passengers, do we? No, sir. So Emily and I didn't get to fly together. There's only 20 pilots. It had to be a scheduling nightmare to make sure we didn't fly together. But one dark and stormy afternoon on December 1977, nobody else could get to the airport. Emily and I could. Um, nobody died. Nobody got, refused to get on the airplane. So they let us fly together for the next, until I had my, um, uh, the time that I needed, and I went back to TWA. That was the first all-female crew in history. So we got to do that. Thank you. Um, Years later, in 2019, in fact, uh, one of the organizations I belong to said that uh, PBS, Aaron Curry, is looking for stories about people that meant something to each other a long time ago and don't know what happened. And I didn't know what had happened to Emily. So I submitted my story. They chose it. And we got to have a PBS special called We'll Meet Again with Ann Curry. And I got, to find, I got to meet Emily. I got to find Emily again. The time with uh, Air Illinois did allow me to apply to all the major airlines. There was an airline called Ozark out of St. Louis that, was, that I wanted because it was closed. They told me I was too short to fly airplanes. Americans said the same thing. I was told I could sue, but I didn't think that was a good way to start a career. Um, TWA, the guys at TWA, I think to prove that I was too short, had put me in the simulator and then found out I wasn't. So I knew I could, I could do the whole job. Um, so I got hired at TWA as a flight 727 flight engineer. A flight engineer is the third person in the cockpit. They used to make airplanes that needed three people. Um, and you sit at the panel in control of all the, um, the uh, systems. They fortunately hired three of us. And uh, they, we needed that, because we needed support. That lasted a year. I got furloughed. Um, I found out there was a cargo company um, hiring. Actually, I wanted my boyfriend I, to come up and interview. While he's interviewing, I'm talking to the secretary. She finds out I'm also a pilot. She starts taking notes, takes it into the chief pilot. And he says, how would you like to be the first woman to fly 747? And I say, I don't think women can do that. 
because the TWA guys had convinced me that this was just a publicity stunt. There's no way they're actually going to let the woman go from, the, from that con panel to behind the controls, and there's no way that she, they're ever going to be able to be a captain because no man in his right mind is going to take lesson orders from a woman, and now you've got a, so a safety issue. But this nice man, this wonderful chief, uh, chief pilot, Captain Hirschberg, said, uh, why? And I said, well, the TWA pilots tell me, you know, I don't have the strength if in case engines go out on one side to keep going straight. He goes, girl, it's hydraulics. I'll show you. And he did. And he made sure that I had the confidence in me and that airplane that he had. And I got to be the first woman to fly a 747. Thank you, Thank you again. Thank you. Um, my uniform in that picture is now in the Smithsonian. And I got to be a answer on Jeopardy? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's when, that's when you know you've made it. Again, uh, furlough. It's not a stable industry. Uh, seaboard became flying tigers. Um, I got furloughed, but I was able to take my experience now to an airline called People Express, where I was a first officer on a 737 for a, and that for a year, and then got to be a 737 captain. And um, another gal and I got to fly together as uh, co-captains. And then we got my favorite airplane, the 747. And I got to fly captain now as a 747 on a flight over to London. Um, out of, in the States, we were kind of used to this. London, it was huge news. I was on um, newspapers, uh, pictures, photographers. Everybody was showing up to um, want to talk to me. I got to be a cover girl. Never thought I'd be a cover girl. <laughs> I got to meet Princess Anne, uh, the lady there. Um, the, it was a charity ball, and they, had, they were honoring a lot of the women from England who, had, who uh, had been in the Olympics, and they made a special category for aviation, and uh, first time for an American. So there's dukes and just duchesses and lords and ladies and me. It was like being Cinderella for the night, right down to having to leave at midnight because it was Thanksgiving in the U.S. the next day, and I had to get back to fly my flight because nobody else was willing to do it. I flew the 7-4 for two years. Um, this is my last flight. Um, they said the cockpit is a, a woman's place is in the cockpit, brought me pink roses. And that tall gentleman, I got the whole crew, all of my flight attendants out on the wing of this airplane. And that tall gentleman in the back, just like he's standing next to me there, loved to be at the bottom of those, uh, as people were leaving, to say, because everybody would, as passengers are coming on, you can't look in the cockpit. So they didn't know I was the captain. I'd make announcements, Captain Ripplemeyer. Well, yeah, we thought you were the captain of the flight attendants. Then there is no such thing. <laughs> but they would invariably shake his hand and say, nice flight, captain. And he loved going, no, I was bringing you your meals. He's six four, I'm five. This was your captain. And they go, but, but, but she's so short, and she's so young. And, and he goes, yeah, and she's female. That was my last hurrah. Um, People Express uh, became Continental. I took a sabbatical, got married, helped start a, a uh, women in aviation uh, booth at the Air and Space Museum in San Diego. Met a wonderful lady who was a wasp. I don't know. Um, I don't have time to tell you what the WASP are. If you do, read my book. <laughs> it's a women's air service pilots. That these women, I got to take a minute. These women flew airplanes from the factory across the Atlantic to deliver them to women, to men at the front. If it wasn't working, they turned back. If it was working, they delivered it. These women flew airplanes much harder and bigger and more difficult than anything I had ever flown. And here I was getting all this credit and like being a pioneer. I hadn't heard of them. I was outraged. You know, why didn't these guys tell me about these women? And they didn't get uh, the credit for being in the service. Some of that's getting fixed now. But anyway, I got to meet one of these wonderful women. She inducted me into the Forest of Friendship. Um, I got divorced, moved my two children to Houston. Uh, the one flight I could fly that allowed me to be home every night was down to Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And <laughs> The first time I said that's what I was going to fly, the chief pilot calls me in and says, what do you think you're doing? That's the most dangerous airport we got. In fact, I think it's the most dangerous airport in the world. And I'm not ha I don't have any instructors right now. What are you trying to pull? And I said, it matches my kid's school schedule. <laughs> I can drop them off, fly to Tegucigalpa, and be back in time to pick them up. So 
That's what we did for 12 years until that three-year-old turned 15. This is the flight into Tegucigalpa, Honduras. It is a challenging airport. We always had missionaries on board, and uh, I was able to bring things down to the people that they were trying to help, because they'd say, you know, we need these things. And again, I said, sure, I can do that. So we started bringing uh, items in. A lot of people from my church started coming and helping me out. Then we found an island off the north coast called Roatan. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we helped out this island in Roatan, and then I retired off of the 787, the Dreamliner. People still needed things in Roatan. Uh, we found a clinic that they couldn't open because they didn't have the money to pay the electric bill. But now that I was retired, I didn't have the money to be able to donate like I used to. So I'm having lunch with some friends, telling them, you know, I can't be doing this. And they said, sure you can. You just start a nonprofit. So we got together and started a nonprofit called Roatan Support Effort. With, if you're a little liberal with the words, it spells rose. <laughs> There's the island of uh, Roatan. That's what it looks like. Beautiful place, but man, the, the extremes of poverty, the have and the have not. So we're trying to bring in and help. These are some of the kinds of supplies we have. Um, some ladies that across the street go to a church that have a sewing circle. So they make um, teddy bears and blankets. I'm going to flash through these. Um, these are some of the teddy bears. Uh, the lady there is the head of the ad administrator of the hospital. I, I couldn't pick one of these pictures. They were just too cute. So we take, um, and then we started making hygiene bags, filling bags with things that the people who showed up at the hospital needed to clean up. Um, each, uh, we helped the clinics, the animal shelter, the community kitchen, um, the soccer teams. So these are some of the, each, each place I had to have somebody that I could hand the donations over to that I could trust to make sure they got to where they were needed the most. The, those uh, bags ended up being the, the highlight of the, <laughs> of the social dinners, the senior dinners, and everybody wanted one. So there they're being handed out. These are my favorite lady, Nidia. We also started taking down used athletic shoes that a shoe store here called Fleet Feet helps by donating their used shoes. These are some of the kids we help. This is the community kitchen, Gina. Uh, quickly, my, um, my favorite, the soccer team that we helped, we started, the shoes, some of them happened to be soccer shoes. And my, so I brought, started bringing soccer shoes and then soccer uniforms. And we were able to create a soccer league, and for the first time, the team was invited over to the mainland to participate in a, um, a, a, a tournament. And that is where the, the scouts watch for talent for their um, national team, the Olympia. And four of the kids um, were picked to be sponsored. Their uniforms paid for, their training paid for. It was the way out of the ghetto or off the island. And we were able to change the rules that instead of keeping the kids off the street with the team, you had to be in school to be able to be on that team. And suddenly kids were showing up for school that hadn't before. People were showing up to have babies at the hospital where they hadn't before. So we were making a difference. And then COVID hit. I couldn't make any trips. So I, bought, so I wrote two books that told all the stories behind those stories that um, my friend, the one, Yvonne, on my, uh, was one of my board we have in the back uh, for sale. All the money from the books do go to Rose as a nonprofit. So, um, and I have a website, www.lynnripplemar.com. If you don't have the chance or time to get one here, um, uh, order it there and I'll send it through the mail. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again next Thursday at 6 p.m. For more information about the Chamber and our podcast, please visit us at ghwcc.org.